No other name that is higher, no other name that is greater, no other name by which this world can be saved other than Jesus. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but that just, every time, as I think about that implications, as I think about my God, as I think about who he is, and his incredible name that is given for us and to us. I don't know. It just changes everything. It just changes everything. You know, and I, I don't know. God's got some crazy stuff that he wants to do today. The Holy Spirit's going to, he's got some, he's got an agenda. He's got a plan. I've got some stuff that I feel God has shown me and spoken to me about, which I'm going to encourage you guys to enter into. Don't be afraid of what he's going to do. Never be afraid of what God wants to do. Trust that he is good, that he is faithful, that the way he wants to speak to you, relate to you, come close to you, come alongside you, help you, heal you, set you free is all for our good. And sometimes things happen and look different and way out and wacky, but don't worry about that. Always just keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Just keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You know, I'm excited because we're going to go into a, we're going to look at Acts again today. We're looking at Acts 19. And I'm excited by it because as I read through Acts 19, it says to me that there is more. Well, I'm excited because as I read Acts 19, it says to me that nothing is impossible. I'm excited because as I read Acts 19, it says to me that there is a deeper place that we can go in God where life flows from everything that we do. That the supernatural works of God are for everybody. That it is not limited just to a few band of people, but it is for everyone that professes to know and follow Jesus. As we turn to this book in Acts 19, what we're going to see is, is that Paul is moving to a place called Ephesus. It is a city on the coast of Turkey. And it had three major, major road networks going to it. One went east to Babylon, one went north to Smyrna, and one went south to the Meander Valley. And it was important because it was a place where people went through to trade and to sell. You know, if you wanted to get your cheap iPod and iPhone and iPads, you would go there because you could pick it up at a, a good price. It had a great market there where you could haggle and you could buy all this kind of stuff. They had a massive temple there, which is to this god called Artemis, the god of the hunt. And in that temple they would worship this God and they would do all kinds of crazy and strange practices. And in fact, in Ephesus they had all kinds of gods that they worshipped. It was a little bit like Devon. There was a spirituality about the place. You know, you'd have your Reiki healers there, you would have had your spiritualists, you'd have people that were trying to contact the dead. You'd have people reading tarot cards and playing with various occult material. There was various spiritualities that were going in that place. But it was also very diverse, every kind of... That kind of social setting was there and every kind of culture was in that place. That if you were a little bit like London maybe in some ways where you get every eclectic mix of music. So you might have R&B and you might have classical, you might have hip hop and you might have some country and western going on. It was a really mix of place of people and groups and things that went on. And Paul turns up in this place and amazing things begin to happen because he opens up heaven and the glory comes down. If you look at Acts 19... We're going to read Acts 19, Ephesus, Paul's left Apollos and he's speaking in Ephesus, it says this in verse 1, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive something of God's power and love into your life? Did you connect with God on a deeper level, he says. And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, into what were you then baptized? He said, into John's baptism. John had been previously baptizing people for repentance. They were saying that they were trying to be washed clean of their sins. So on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. He baptized them again. And then when he lays hands on them, the Holy Spirit comes on them and they begin to speak in tongues and prophesying. They begin to speak in other languages and they begin to speak the truth of God. These people that didn't even know about this Holy Spirit, something transformational happens to them. There was about 12 men in all that was, this phenomenon was happening to and then afterwards, they entered the synagogue. That's where the Jews met. And for three months, they spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is key theme in the book of Acts. 
But when someone became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Paul turns up in Ephesus and he stirs up a bit of a riot, we'll see later on. He, something significant takes place. It's, you know, I don't know about you, but maybe you go to different places and life is fairly ordinary. You go to work, maybe you go on holiday and nothing much happens around you. You might kind of enjoy what you're doing and how you're hanging out with different people, but nothing significant takes place. But what I read here in the book of Acts is that wherever God's people go, there is an impact on that culture, that society, that people group. They can't go anywhere without something of God's kingdom breaking into earth. They literally can't get up out of bed in the morning without facilitating something of God into people's lives. They had such an intention, an intention to see God's glory and God's kingdom impact this earth for good, to see the brokenness and the pain transformed and changed. They had such a desire in their heart to connect with God on a profound and deep level that everything they did had purpose and meaning. Everything that they did had purpose, direction and meaning. That they had a plan and, a, and an ideal and a goal. That they knew that the only answer was the name of Jesus. They knew that they needed to share that with people. They knew that they didn't just need to speak it, but they needed to demonstrate it and live it out. And we see in Ephesus that this begins to happen. They meet this group of people and they know something about God, but they've never experienced him. Maybe there's some people here today, you've heard of this God. Maybe you know something about him. Maybe you've been brought up in Sunday school, you've been dragged along to church a couple of times, but you've never experienced this God. Today, the Holy Spirit is here, and he wants to reveal himself to you. You see, these people hadn't known of the Holy Spirit, and yet they are baptized, they are laid hands Paul lays hands on them and suddenly the Holy Spirit empowers them and fills them. So much so that they start to speak in other languages. See, the gift of tongues is in the Bible. It's about speaking in a different language so that other people can hear what God is saying. Sometimes he gives us a heavenly language that only he understands, but it's a way that we can communicate to God on a deeper level. I love it in the Psalms where it talks about the deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfall, that there's a deep groaning, a deep connection that we can have with God as we speak out in these other tongues and other languages, as we connect with God. And they also prophesied. They began to hear about what God was saying and they began to share it and to speak it out. And what I want you to know, the important thing about this part of the passage and this message is that this is for everyone. This is for everyone, everyone in this room. If you love Jesus, if you've given your life to him, if you are willing to allow his spirit to invade your life, you can prophesy, you can speak the things of God into people's lives. You can speak other languages as he gives you the power to do so. You can pray for the sick and they will get well. You can pray for the dead and they will be raised to life. You can cast out demons and they will flee. Because God's great love is so compellingly powerful that things change and happen when we connect with him on that deep, deep level. That place of intimacy where we experience something of God's love for us that we can't help but love. And when we love, love always has action. See, love never just sits back in a chair and says, oh well, c'est la vie, life is life. Don't care about my friends at school. They're okay. Let them get on with where they're going. Don't worry about the guys at work. It doesn't just sit back. Love motivates. Love compels us. Love pushes us forward. Love makes us get out of bed and do something different. And we can only do that if we experience God's love in our hearts. And what I want to encourage you today, encourage you if you have not experienced that, to say, God, I need you. To experience you, God, I need to experience your love for me, that transforming spirit and life and power in my life, so that wherever you have called me to do, whatever you have called me to be, I will do it for you. You see, there are some people that worry about what the Holy Spirit may ask of them. There are various reasons why we don't experience God in this way, and it's sometimes one of them is fear. You know, what is the Holy Spirit going to do? Is he going to knock me off my feet? 
Or is he going to make me kind of roll around and shake a little bit, get the holy jitters? <laughs> I love the holy jitters. <laughs> is he going to ask me to go and speak to somebody? I'm really scared to speak to them about it. Well, I don't want to, but he's going to ask me. He's going to ask me to do something I really hate. There's this fear. What is he going to ask of me? Because we love to control our lives and our destinies. And yet, when we get to this place where we say, I'm yours, this word yield means to give ourselves fully to God is the place where he uses us. You see, we don't need to fear this God. Not in that way. He's a God to be feared, but not what he will do, because what he does is always good. What he does is always good. See, other reasons why we may not enter into what God has for us is we feel inadequate. We might say, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I am. You don't know how, what I kind of think sometimes when I'm at home alone and the thoughts that go through my head. You don't know the way I speak to my spouse or the way I've dealt with my children. You just don't know. God will never use me. I'm too inadequate. He's not going to fill me with his spirit. I love the fact that God doesn't call us well. He doesn't call us when we're qualified. He calls us and then he enables us. You see, we all fall short, the Bible says, of God's glory. We all don't quite measure up to the standard God has set for us. And yet, you know, the incredible thing is that when we give ourselves to God with all our thoughts and our problems and we fix our eyes on him and allow him to fill our lives, it's funny how those things begin to fade away. It's funny how we begin to change from the inside out. It's funny how these problems and these issues that look so big become so small. Never feel adequate. If you feel inadequate today, you are the ones that God has come for. You are the ones that he wants to feel afresh. You are the ones that he wants to empower in such a way that you will be transforming lives around you if you give him the chance. See, fear and inadequacy will prohibit us, stop us from entering into what God has. But if we let them go and we follow the Christ, the Jesus, the one we love, he will take us forward and on. I keep thinking of that song, which just talks about the, the rain of God's spirit that falls upon us. The rain of your spirit that falls afresh upon us. That rain that comes and refreshes our soul, God is desperate to pour his love on you. He's longing to pour his love on your life. You see, you may love the way things go and you may be good at what you do, but God can take your life to a new level. It might be that you're passionate about singing. It might be that you're passionate about photography. It might be you're passionate about mathematics even and accounting and all that kind of stuff. Maybe you're a, a real intellectual and, and sometimes we think, how could God fit into those areas of my life? How can he fit into my style and my, the way that I live? And yet God doesn't have to because he's created those things. He's created you the person you are. He's given you those likes and desires. The things that you connect with most. They are the things of God and God can take them and use them. Don't ever think that the thing that you like, unless it's obviously sinful, is, is beyond what God wants for your life. He can take those and bring them to new places. You see, the Holy Spirit is for all of us. And it says here that those that are willing will receive. I love it, what Jesus said. He was up on a mountain one time and he was preaching. Jesus loved to preach on mountaintops. And he said this, he said, blessed, most happy, most excited, most fulfilled people are those that are poor in spirit because they will inherit the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God. What is the poor in spirit? They are those of us that are dependent fully on God. Those of us that have given ourselves fully to God, we actually inherit God's kingdom. It literally makes access for us to heaven. It enables us to pull open the resources of heaven in its fullness and see them deposited on earth. The poor in spirit, those are dependent on God. We have access to a throne room where we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, where the fullness of God dwells and we can see and administer God's love and kingdom and care to this earth. The poor in spirit, those of us dependent upon God, God opens up every opportunity and possibility for us. This is incredible if we can grab hold of it. 
Do you know, one of the tragedies that I see is that there are so many Christians today, those of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus, that don't realize the power God has invested in us. There's so many of us that don't realize how much God has invested in us. The Holy Spirit has placed a calling and a power and a, a love in our lives. And, and you know what, sometimes I, I kind of was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, if we were going to go into battle as a country, as a nation, if we were going to go to war, you know, we wouldn't be taking bows and arrows with us anymore, would we? You know, okay, we're gonna, we're, some uh, eastern countries coming over, they want to attack us, and we just go, let's get out the cupboards, the bows and arrows that we used to use, and we'll, 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 we'll have a go at fighting back. No, we would take all our artillery, artillery. We would take our tanks and our planes. We'd have our best soldiers. And you know what? Sometimes I feel the church is a bit like the bows and arrows thing. The church kind of says, well, I've got a little bit of something of God. I've got a little bow and arrow, and I'm going to go out with this, and I'm going to go out with that. And we don't realize that we have tanks, and we have <laughs> planes, and we have this incredible warfare that comes through God's power and spirit in our lives. And, and we always sometimes sit on the back foot thinking, oh, no, we've just got to make it through life. We've just got to get through this. You know, if we can just, just do our best to maybe make our way through. And we seem to always just not, I don't know why it is, there's this mentality of, of, of just making do, of just doing what we can to get through. And yeah, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, it says to me that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We are more than conquerors. We don't even have to just win a little bit. We thrash the enemy. We absolutely obliterate him. He's destroyed. The Lord God says in the book of Ephesians, which Paul writes about where he is, he says, all things are under our feet. All things. There is nothing that overcomes us. There is nothing that can overwhelm us. There is nothing that can defeat us. For Jesus has won. Do you know that he has won the battle? You know, we need some fresh revelation of God in our lives. And I know life is tough. Believe you me, I know life is tough. I know what it is to experience pain and hardship. I know what it is to struggle with life and not know how to even get up in, out of bed in the morning. And yet I still believe he is the one that overcomes. I truly believe he is the one. And in him, which is where we are placed, we overcome too. I want to encourage us, if today you have not experienced something of God's love and his power and his spirit in your life, today's the day to say, yes, me, Lord. You know, when you know, so who wants the sweet? And everyone puts their hand up, you know. Who wants it? Yes, me, Lord, I want it. For the hungry, he gives and satisfies. Because what he wants to do is he wants to turn this world upside down with his love. You know, and I'm talking about God's power here, and I've been talking about God's love, but it is, but it is the love that is the essential part. You know, we don't just go out into people's lives because we're trying to convert them. We don't just go out into people's lives because we want to give them a message. We go out into people's lives because we love them. We have to love them first. We have to love like God loves first. We truly have to care for the needs of the poor and the broken. For those that even think they've got it all figured out, they've got wealth and everything behind them. We've got to love these people as Jesus loves them. It is pointless. People see through it if you're just trying to convert someone. You can't convert anyone. Give up, man. Just love people and let the Holy Spirit convert them. You know, there's going to be a time, and there are times coming when we will walk into rooms and places, and because of the overflow of God's love in our heart, it will trigger something in the heavens, and people's lives will be impacted without even words. That's God's love in action. Look what happens when Paul and the followers start to walk in this. Verse 11, it says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs, anyone got a handkerchief? Maybe a snotty rag? <laughs> Tissue that you've coughed in a few times? Uh, Paul got them out and he got some aprons. And he said, and he touched the skin. Those that touched his skin, they were carried away to the sick. And their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jews, exorcists, <laughs> undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by this Jesus whom Paul proclaims, and then they get overrun by demons because they don't actually know this Jesus. 
And yet what it's saying is, is that extraordinary things happen. God doesn't always do it in the ways that we think. I've got some handkerchiefs down here, in fact. It's just a handkerchief. I haven't actually blown my nose in it. Not yet. You can have one with snot in if you want, but you can have it clean. I felt God said we needed handkerchiefs today. I haven't told anyone, I think. I don't think. Um, and then Benita had a word while she was praying, saying she saw white bits of cloth. <laughs> This is just a bit of cloth. And I'm no one special, apart from God makes me special <laughs> because he loves me. And you know what? That we can deposit something of God on this. You know, a little bit like if a robber goes around your house and you, they take stuff, they, 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 they sweep for fingerprints, don't they? There's always something left when we touch something. You can find remnants of DNA or hair or something. In the same way, if we are that full of God, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, he can't help but rub off. That's why we lay hands on people. Because we're, 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 we're living out, we're practically demonstrating something of God into people's lives. The whole idea of prophecy, the whole idea of, of being prophetic is that we demonstrate something in the natural that imitates, well not imitates, but releases something in the supernatural. So if we lay hands on someone, we're saying receive something of God in the, and we're doing it in the natural, but we're believing supernaturally something will be imparted to them. In the same way, if we touch a handkerchief and we say, Lord Jesus, use this for your glory. Let your glory fill this so that it heals the sick, that it releases depression, that it raises people up, that it reverts poverty. We prophetically believe that in the natural and we're taking a natural stance, but we believe that in the supernatural that it would take place. If you have somebody today that you, God has put a love in your heart for and they have something that they are struggling with, whether it's a sickness, whether it is financial, whether it is material, whatever it might be, I'm going to encourage you during the worship at the end to come and get one. And by faith, take, give it to them and say, I give this to you as a sign of God's love for you. I give this to you because God wants to touch your life and heal you or set you free or provide for you or whatever it might be. Take the risk. Make the step. Be bold. Take one. Give it to somebody. And then allow God to do the rest. We're going to do that in the worship at the end. It's in the Bible, guys. I'm not making this up. This is not something that we're just doing for the fun of it. We truly believe that we to demonstrate God's kingdom in its fullness. That we truly to believe that everything that is in this book is for us. And it's time the church begins to believe it and walk in it. It's time for us to stop just thinking these are great ideas, but experiencing the fullness of what God has for us. Church, I see it so much. I'm seeing it going on. I'm seeing people stepping out. I'm seeing a, a hunger growing. And God loves it. God says to us, he's happy. He's well pleased with you, Mars Hill Church. He loves your hearts. He loves the way that you love him. He loves the way that you want more of him. He loves the way that you're expecting for him to move. He loves the way that you love people and he's going to use it. I want to encourage you today, he's going to use it because he loves the way you love. And if you don't know that love, just get into it today. It's amazing what, what takes place as they start to move and operate in this. Verse 14, it says, Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. They were trying to do the Jesus thing, but without knowing him. And it says, The evil spirits answered them and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I even recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all, all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was lifted high. Also, many of those who were believe, weren't believers came confessing and divulging their practices. The spiritualists were coming. The Buddhists were coming. <laughs> The people that read your tarot cards and read your palms and think they can contact your dead ancestors, they were all coming. They were giving their lives to Jesus. And it says, a number of them who had practiced magic arts, the witches and the warlocks, they brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevailed mightily 
The word of the Lord increased and prevailed. It overcame mightily. The, the people that were after counterfeit spiritualities realized that only Jesus is the real deal. You see, when you are confounded and confronted with the real thing, you don't want the counterfeit. You don't want the fake. And you see what the devil tries to do, and his little minions of demons, they try to create counterfeits truths. So there are people that believe that they can heal people through focusing energies, and they will be successful because demons make it look so. And there are people that will say that they can read your destiny through cards, and they will be successful because demons make them look so, but it is all counterfeit. It is all demonic. It is all there to take your eyes off the true living God and to put it on something other than him. To put our faith in who we are in terms of what we can do through our own power and strength rather than resting and relying on him. Anything that, is, that, it, that operates without the name of Jesus is counterfeit. Everything that operates without recognizing that Jesus is Lord and that he is king over all is counterfeit and demonic. And I encourage you, if you're involved in any of that, to leave it behind and grab hold of the real thing. I have seen it, where people have been caught up in all kinds of spiritualities. They found Jesus, and they have to walk away from that. You don't even have to tell them. You don't even have to tell them it's bad. But they find Jesus, and they walk away from it because they see that he makes the difference, and he is real. And I want him to encourage us to walk in the real truth of God, to walk in this power. I don't want people going down to the Carton Theatre when they have a seance night, thinking that that's where they need to go to get answers to their life and getting caught up in the devil's schemes and works. I want people to come into the church and knocking on your doors and waking you up in the night, saying, I need something of God in my life, that he's the only one that seems to actually make the difference. I've tried all this stuff. I've, I've messed with crystals. I've done Ouija boards. I've tried everything. But actually, only Jesus makes the difference in my life and I've just seen it I've just seen the power that's at work I've seen the love that's in your heart and I need the real thing Amen. you're going to get those phone calls soon you're going to get those knocks on the door but we've got to not keep it to ourselves we can't keep it hidden it's not just for these walls it's not just for here on a Sunday it's not for our, just for our connect group or our prayer meetings this is something that we need to demonstrate on a daily basis this is something that we need to live out in a real world and a real life do you know what? I was, in a, I was at a conference this weekend. I got back late last night, a church planting conference, and I was just chatting to some people there. And one of the guys is an evangelist, and he was saying how he's sharing God on the streets and how he preaches the word and how he sees people come to know him. And we were just talking about, though, that we need something more than just words. We need something more than just a book that has pages in, but we need something of the power of God to make it alive. We need something of God's demonstration of his glory. We need to see people be pulled out of wheelchairs and begin to walk. And then we can tell them about the Jesus that loves them. We need to be able to go into our schools and pray for those with the broken legs and see the casts come off the next week and tell them it's because it's a Jesus that loves them. We need to be, peop to, to be people that are available for those that have been going down dark spiritual alleys and reveal them the light of Jesus so that they're pulled out of darkness into light. People that live in on a daily basis, seeing God's kingdom come, seeing lives transformed and changed. See, Ian said last week about rivers and cities. Do you know what I believe rivers and cities are there for? They're there for to increase our faith. Rivers and cities are there for us to demonstrate who God is in our lives. Problems and situations that arise are for us to say that we can overcome through God's power in our lives. If we do things that just re require human effort, then it doesn't demonstrate a supernatural God. See, for me, the supernatural nature of God is the normal Christian life. The normal way to walk as a Christian is supernaturally. He's a supernatural God. He's not naturally super. Superman. This is the God that we serve. You see, we are embarking on buying this premises if we can get to speak to some people about it. We had a figure in recently about how much they want for it. It's pretty cheap, I think. And so we're in discussions now about what that looks like and how that proceeds. But we need Jesus to pay the, for it. I ain't got the money in my pocket. <laughs> but I believe that Jesus is asking us to do that. God's taken us a very similar story as a family. I believe a prophetic statement that God is asking us to do some stuff. Step out and trust him as we sell our home and God moves us on. and Not on away from here, but on into something new. <laughs> and that's the way God wants us to live every day 
Every day is a new opportunity. Every day is something different. Why is life so boring? Because we don't actually experience God's fullness. Why do we get think, think Christianity is mundane? Because we're following a religion rather than the Christ. See, things change when you live with a dynamic God who you see cities and rivers and they just, they're just opportunities to demonstrate his faithfulness and, and his love. They don't become hardships or problems. They don't become worries or fears. They just become exciting opportunities. How is God going to get us over this one? There's a big river in the way. How God is going to get us over this one? Whoa, he's going to actually make us float over it. He's not even going to part it this time. We're actually going to fly over it. We're going to go underneath it. Whatever it is that God wants to do, it's an opportunity to increase our faith. I heard this weekend someone say this statement, and this is probably the most exciting thing I heard over the weekend, was this. That if we had 15%, just 15% of Christians who loved God passionately enough to be motivated by his gospel, to demonstrate his kingdom and his power, a nation can be changed. 15% and a nation can be changed. So what's 15% of Tynmouth? A couple of thousand maybe? A couple of thousand? What's God said to us? He's going to give us a few thousand. A town can be changed with a few thousand people who are passionate for Jesus though. Not those that are comfy sitting back, happy just to kind of get on with life and let it pass by. I'm saved and that's all right. But passionate pursuing people that are motivated by his love. 15% of us and a nation can be changed. What about your school? How many people have you got in your school? I don't know. Maybe it's a few thousand All you need is 150 people who are passionate for Jesus and your school can be turned around. What about your workplace? How many people do you have working with you? I don't know, maybe it's 20, 30, 40, 50. Maybe 10 or 15 people. And that workplace can be turned around. This is incredible truth. It requires, Jesus took 12 people and he transformed a nation, a city, a world even. I'm excited by that. I believe that's what God's actually calling us to. And this number of 2,000 keeps coming into our heads. And I believe it's because it's, I believe because God is sweeping across this nation and he's raising up pockets of Christians that are passionate, purposeful people because he knows that nations need to be changed because he's coming again soon. He knows, he knows it. He knows he's coming again soon. And he desires that none perish, but all will have eternal life. If you haven't experienced something of God to, yet, yeah, today is your opportunity to receive him. If you need to be filled up again because you're feeling dry and you're thirsty, today is the day to be filled afresh again. See, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. We all need to be refilled and refilled and refilled with God's love and purpose and glory in our lives. Every day, every moment of every day, today is the opportunity for that. I want to leave you with something that God has really been speaking to me a lot about. <laughs> it's just been playing it over in my head over and over again. It just says this, book of Zechariah. It says this. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, not by human effort, not by our own strengths, not by our own wits or our own intelligence, not by our own power and our own strength, but by his spirit, says the Lord. Lord Jesus, we are here for you. Holy Spirit, rain down. Lord Jesus, fill these thirsty hearts again. Holy Spirit, just come and fill this place with your glory. Holy Spirit, we are hungry and we are thirsty and we need you. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray today. Holy Spirit, I pray today that you will work in people's lives that haven't experienced you and they will feel you and experience you afresh. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just be silent for a moment. Let's just be silent for a moment. I just want you to put your attentions on God for a moment. First of all, I want to invite everybody here today that hasn't experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit to stand. Be brave. If you haven't experienced something of God and you want to experience Him 
in his fullness. You may have given your life to Jesus, but you have not heard of this Holy Spirit. You may have heard of him, but you've not experienced him. And if you want to experience him in his fullness, to the transformational life of Jesus, I'm going to encourage you just to stand. As everyone's got their eyes closed, just where you are right now, just stand. Maybe the bravest thing you've ever done. It may even be the most wackiest thing you've ever done, but you won't be left the same. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He's going to blow something of his spirit and wind across this building. You might feel just a gentle breeze. Thank you, Jesus. More of you. More of you.